Hey guys, it's Mr. L coming back at you with another video. And in this video, we're going to talk about quantitative values. So this video is going to focus on numbers. So we're going to talk about the units that we use on numbers, measured versus calculated values, uncertainty and error with these values, significant digits and dimensional analysis. So let's get into the video. So the first thing we're going to discuss in this video is the idea of an international system of units or SI units. These came from a French idea, but it's been later used all around the world and we mostly use metric system now. The biggest difference between SI units and metric units are with the mass unit. The base unit in the SI system is the kilogram and in the metric system it's the gram. But a lot of the other units are the same. So when we're talking about mass, if we're going to stick with the metric units here, we typically use gram for mass. For length, the base unit is meter. For time, the base unit is second. For temperature, the base unit is Kelvin, though in the lab we typically use degrees Celsius. A big one for chemistry is the mole or for the amount of substance. We use mole a lot in the lab, a lot in our calculations. For volume, a cubic centimeter or a liter is typical. And then we have a lot of other ones called derived units, which are units made up of other units. So a unit of pressure like Pascal or the unit of density in gram per milliliter is going to be a derived unit. The next thing we're going to need to discuss in this video is the idea of SI prefixes. We use prefixes in science to denote the scientific notation of something or an order of magnitude bigger or smaller from the base value. So we typically write scientific notation when we jot down in our lab notebook or we publish things in academic journals. So we use these prefixes here to denote how far off of the base unit we are. And the most common ones that we see in chemistry are nano, micro, milli, the base unit, kilo, mega, and giga. If you notice here looking at this chart, it's a pattern if we follow the metric system which makes this system so easy to use. It goes one, two, three from the base unit in either direction, either the positive one, positive two, or positive three, or negative one, negative two, negative three modifier on our base 10. And then after that we go by sets of three. So after 10 to the third, we go 10 to the sixth, 10 to the nine, 10 to the 12, as well as in the smaller direction, 10 to the negative three, 10 to the negative six, 10 to the negative nine. We also have this idea of an exact number versus an inexact number. An exact number or an example of this would be something like a dozen. Whether you have a dozen pencils, a dozen eggs, a dozen donuts, you're gonna have 12 of those objects. That is an exact value. Same with a pair. A pair is always going to be two. If I have a pair of shoes or a pair of pants, it's got two legs. So those are exact numbers. A lot of the numbers we use in the lab are called inexact numbers due to us having error in our measurement. So a lot of the tools that we use, whether it be a balance or a graduated cylinder or a burette, they're all going to have different error associated with them. And you're going to have to make a guesstimate as the scientist eventually using these tools. And that leads to uncertainty. Therefore, we have an inexact number. So if we were to compare different glasswares, if we compared a beaker and a flask, which we already saw in the previous video is not so good at measuring exact volumes of things compared to a good measuring tool like a graduated cylinder or a burette, they're going to have different accuracies and different errors associated with them. The next thing we're going to look at is the difference between accuracy and precision. So you can see here in this little diagram, this is just a visual representation of accuracy versus precision, but the definition of accuracy is how close you are to the accepted value. So if you're doing a, uh, an example like this, and we have some darts getting thrown at a dartboard, the center of the dartboard is the accepted value or the bullseye. So the closer you are to the bullseye, the more accurate your values are. If we were to give this as an example of numerical values in the lab, and we're trying to calculate the density of water at four degrees Celsius, that's very close to one gram per milliliter. 
So if we took a bunch of different measurements and we got 0.99993 gram per milliliter, if we had some great glassware and a great balance to get that many decimal values, I would say that is very accurate. And how we can tell how far we are from the given value is using the percent error calculation shown here. The other word, vocabulary word I mentioned was precision. Well, precision it is, is how close your values are to your other values. So even though you may be collecting values and they may be far from the accepted value, if all of your values are relatively close to each other, they're very precise. So you may have a systematic error, maybe you have an uncalibrated balance and you're off by one gram for every measurement. So all of your measurements are very close to each other, but they're all off by a gram from the accepted value. You would have very precise value, but you wouldn't have very accurate values. So typically when we go to work with accurate values and precise values, we need to take the overall average of the values that we're working with. So you would want to make most recordings in the lab as duplicate at a minimum, but most people try to do things in triplicate, which means you're going to measure that thing three times and find the average of that. And that's what you would report in your journal or your report in class. So the next idea I want to discuss with you guys is the idea of significant digits. And the reason why we use significant digits in the lab and in our reporting is so that we don't overstate the accuracy of our measured values. If you have a centigram balance and that goes to two decimal places, you wouldn't want to be reporting five decimal places. That doesn't really make any sense. So we have a set of rules that we need to follow called the significant figure rules. And on these significant figure rules, there are four primary rules. We're not going to cover the odd and even rule in this video. So we're going to focus on these four rules. The first rule is that all non-zero values are significant. So any tool that you have that gives you a non-zero value, that's going to be significant and it's going to matter. The second rule in the sig fig rules is that all values between zeros are going to matter. So if you had a one, a zero, a zero, and a one, those two zeros sandwiched between the one are going to matter. So you would have four total significant digits in that value that I just gave you an example of. The third rule is that zeros in front of non-zero values in front of a decimal or even behind a decimal don't matter. All those zeros in the front of that number are irrelevant because you can rewrite this in scientific notation and that doesn't tell you the degree of certainty that you have. The fourth rule is that zeros trailing after a significant digit after a decimal place do matter because you're telling the reader that you have a glassware tool that can be capable of reading to that decimal place. So having a decimal place is really going to matter when you start dealing with zeros. And in a minute here, we're going to get on the whiteboard and do a bunch of examples so you guys understand what I'm talking about. The next thing we're going to talk about are the mathematical operations when you begin to start using values with significant digits. The first set of rules we have here are addition and subtraction. This is going to depend on the amount of your most vague digit that you have. If you have decimal values and it goes to one or two decimal places and you have another value that only goes to one decimal place, then the one with the least number of decimal places is what you're going to need to round your value to after you average these values. The next set of rules here is multiplication and division. This is a little bit easier because you only need to know how many significant digits are total in the, in the values that you have. So if you have a value that has three significant digits versus two significant digits, your average value can only have two significant digits because you always need to show the one with the least accuracy. You can't overstate the accuracy of your measurement. You have to go with your worst measurement. In regards to rounding, if you have two values and then you need to round to that two significant digit spot, then you just need to look for a five. If it's a five or greater, then you can round it up. And if it's below a five, then you can round down. The last thing we're going to talk about before we get on the whiteboard is the idea of dimensional analysis. We're eventually going to need to start doing math in the lab and in class so that we can convert one unit to the next. And the way that we do this is through this idea called dimensional analysis. 
So you're going to have some value and it's going to have a unit on it. And then you're going to use this thing called a conversion factor, which is basically just a fraction with units on the top and the bottom. The point of these units is to cancel out the unit by putting a unit on the bottom that matches up with your original value. And your new unit is going to be on top of the fraction. And then when you do the math, you're going to be left over with the new unit. This is called dimensional analysis. So let's get on the whiteboard now and go over all of these things we just discussed so that you can actually see this stuff written down. So here we are on the whiteboard. What I want to first show you guys on the whiteboard is what we use common units for. So for the unit of mass, we typically use the metric system gram as our base unit. For length, we use the unit meter as our base unit. For time, we have the base unit of second. For temperature, in the lab, we use both Kelvin and degree Celsius. Good degree Celsius. Calvin is the base unit, but we commonly use degrees Celsius. Another one is for amount of substance. We use the unit mole a lot in chemistry class. And volume, we use the unit cubic centimeter, which is equivalent to a milliliter, which is equivalent to a cc. And the other one I want you guys to know is liter and liter is equal to a decimeter cubed all right so you're going to need to know those two conversion cap two conversion factors for chemistry class all right next thing i want to show you guys are the si prefixes so that we can modify things into scientific notation so here we've got a small chart of the most commonly used si prefixes in chemistry class so here are your prefixes and here's your base 10 modifier. So this is what we're going to modify the base unit by to get this to show us our order of magnitude, smaller or larger, depending on what kind of unit we are using. So if we picked our favorite base unit, say it's meter, meter's base unit is going to be 10 to the 0, which is equal to 1. So let's go in the small direction first. We could have a decimeter, which is 10 to the negative 1, or 0 0.1 meters. We also have centimeter, 10 to the negative 2. Or we could also write this as 1 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. We also have millimeter, 10 to the negative 3 modifier. And then after we get to the 3s, like we mentioned before in the video, it's going to go by set of 3 after that. So after millimeter, we're going to have micrometer. And that micro is Greek letter mu, like a cat. Mu, mu is 10 to the negative 6. So we could write that as 1 times 10 to the negative 6 meters, or a micrometer. And then the last one we have is nanometer, small n, 10 to the negative 9. If we're going to go in the big direction, so we'll go above our base unit meter, we're going to do 10 to the third, which is kilometer or kilometer. So that would be equal to 1 times 10 to the third meters. Then after that, we have mega meter, 10 to the sixth, and giga meter, 10 to the ninth, or 1 times 10 to the ninth meters. So you could see that this metric prefixes are very convenient so that it represents our times 10 modifier to put this into scientific notation. All right, next thing we're going to look at here is temperature. So our temperature, the two values we're going to use most often in this class are degrees Celsius and Kelvin. And we can easily convert between one and the other by adding or subtracting by 273.15. So Kelvin will be equal to our degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So if we had something like 20 degrees Celsius, we would add 273.15, and we would have then 293.15 Kelvin.
and it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. The other thing I wanted to mention here was that the scale of Celsius is based off of the boiling point of water. So the zero value on degrees Celsius is based off of the freezing point of water, and the 100 value on degrees Celsius is based off the boiling point of water. The Calvin scale are absolute values, so there is no such thing as a negative value on the Calvin scale. The lowest possible value on the Calvin scale is zero Calvin, and we call that absolute zero. So now let's talk about an example of a derived unit like density. Density is a derived unit because it's made of multiple other units. It's based off of mass over the volume. So you're going to have a unit of mass, typically it's going to be in grams, and a unit of volume could be centimeter cubed or a milliliter. But it could be any mass value over any volume value. So let's do an example of this. Say we're going to find the density of a particular substance, and we put it on an analytical balance, and we get a mass value of 9.378 grams. And then we use a graduated cylinder, and we use displacement method to find its volume. And we find that the volume is 15.25 milliliters. So all we would need to do is pull up our calculator and take 9.378 divided by our 15.25, and we get this long number. So this is going to begin to go into our significant figure rules. So we'll, we'll, go, af we'll go over that after this, but here we've got four significant digits on the top, four significant digits on the bottom, so our answer should be have four significant digits. And if we look here, our value after the four spot is four nine and the cutoff after that's a five so we can round up so we would say that our density is zero point six one five zero gram per milliliter so that would be the density of this substance so now is a good time to talk about our sig fig rules so our sig fig rules the first one is that all non-zero digits are significant so if we have something like 1, 3, 7, 8 grams, we would have four significant digits because all of these values are non-zeros. The second rule of sig figs is that zeros between two significant figures are themselves significant. So if we had 2,002 meters, these two zeros sandwiched between two non-zero values become significant. So we would have four sig figs in both of these. The third rule is that zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. So if we had something like 0 0.000839 milligrams, all of these zeros are not significant because they're at the beginning of a, a value, and we could easily rewrite this in scientific notation. So we would only have three significant digits. The last rule is that zeros at the end of a number are significant if a decimal place is written in the number. And that's telling the reader of the number that you have an instrument capable of reading to that value. So you have to be really picky if you see a decimal place or not. So a number something like 5,000, there's no decimal place, so all of these values would not be significant and there would be only one sig fig. But something like 5,000 with a decimal place, now you have four sig figs, and you may have a zero here. That would be five sig figs. So this value would have five significant digits. So it really matters if you have a decimal place and then trailing values. So when you go to do math, you're going to need to know significant figure rules for two different sets of systems, addition and subtraction, and multiplication and division. So when you're doing addition and subtraction, what you're really interested in is how many decimal values are after that whatever value you might have, unless you don't have a decimal value. But let's use one with, with a decimal value. So if we have 9.37 grams, and we wanted to go to average this, and we used another balance that only could go to one decimal place, and we got 9.4 grams, when we go to add these, we can only be as good as our worst measurement so we can only be as good as this, this place, 
the tens place. We can't go to the hundreds place when we go to add these. So you would have 18.77, but then you would need to round up to the one decimal place. So then this would become 18.8 .8 grams after you round. So this is the addition and subtraction rule. It's based on the number of places to the least values place. Multiplication division is a little different. All that matters is the total number of sig figs. So say we go to multiply two numbers, we have 18.379 meters multiplied by 2.37 meters. This one has three sig figs versus five sig figs, so our answer can only have three sig figs. So if we were to do the math, we would have 18.379 times 2.37. And then we can only go to three significant digits. We have a 0.5 with another 5 trailing it, so we'd bump it up to a 6. So this would be 43.6 meters squared. Addition and subtraction is based on least number of decimal places. Multiplication and division is based on the least number of significant digits. So the last thing we're going to go over on the whiteboard here is an example of dimensional analysis. So we have to use this thing called a conversion factor, which is basically just a fraction with units in it. So if we have something like 15 kilometers, and we want to go to see how many centimeters there are, we're going to need to use this thing called a conversion factor. Conversion factor is just a fraction. What we're going to do is we're going to want to get rid of kilometers. So if it's on top, to get rid of it, we're going to need to put kilometers on the bottom. And I said we're going to go to centimeters. So wherever you're going to is going to go on top. So then the next question I like to ask myself is which of these is bigger? Kilo is 10 to the third, centi is 10 to the negative second. So kilo is bigger, so I like to give the bigger one a 1, and then we'll always be dealing with bigger values. Ten, kilo is 10 to the third, so kilo is 10 to the third. Centi is 10 to the negative 2, so there are 5 spots difference between 3 and negative 2, so we're going to have 5 zeros trailing this. So this would be 1 times 10 to the 5th centimeters. It will always be a positive exponent if we use the 1 spot always being the biggest value. So then you just multiply across, our kilometers will cancel out, so then we would have 15 times 10 to the 5th, we're going to need to move our decimal place one over to the left to write proper scientific notation. So this would be 1.5 times 10 to the 6th centimeters in this sample. I'll show you one more example. Let's use density because that has two units. So say we have something like 13.9 gram per milliliter. And I want my answer in terms of kilograms. Per liter. So if we've got two units to convert, we're going to need two conversion factors. So I'm just going to make two conversion factors right next to each other. And then you just need to pick a unit that you want to convert first. I'm going to convert the mass unit first, gram. So the gram is on top. To get rid of it, I'm going to put it on the bottom. The next unit of mass we're going to over in our answer is kilogram. So I'm going to write kilogram on top. And kilograms bigger. Kilos 10 to the third, gram is 10 to the zero, which is a thousand factor, or one times 10 to the third. So now our grams would cancel out. So then we have to convert our milliliters. Our milliliters on the bottom here, so that means we're going to need to have milliliter on the top of our next conversion factor in order for them to cancel out. And then our liter is going to need to go on the bottom because it's in the bottom of our answer. So liters bigger. Liters 10 to the 0, milliliters 10 to the negative third, which is three spots different. So again, we have 1 times 10 to the third. Our gram will cancel out. Our milliliter will cancel out. And we're left with kilogram per liter. Our 10 to the thirds are equivalent, so they're going to cancel out as well. So lucky enough, all we actually are going to do is just copy our value over here. And it's already been converted for us. So there it is, guys. There's the video on numerical values, quantitative values, dimensional analysis, significant figures, exact versus inexact numbers, and uncertainty. So if you enjoyed this video, if you found it useful, 
tell your uncle, tell your favorite scorpion, get everybody subscribed. Let's shoot this up to the top of the YouTube algorithm and we'll see you in the next video.